secondary weapon doesn't really matter. Uh, I mean, a lot of people will tell you that active radars are the best, but please don't actually use active radars. It's a bad idea. ECM jammers are a definite must. The reason for this is when you use them, it takes you off the radar, so you can do switches and different maneuvers to move yourselves onto the enemy's tail and to help use them from your tail. Um, this one, I guess belt feeder. I don't really know. I use belt feeder. Nothing else really gives you an advantage. Then your camo is really important. You know, you just gotta gotta pick one that fits you. You know, makes you feel makes you feel good about yourself. Yeah, and that's about it for the setup. Now let's go into settings. Some of this is important. Um. The way I use for butt setting or buttons, I use the veteran buttons, which changes, yeah, it changes the throttle because the throttle in default is like on the stick, which is, I don't know, it's confusing to me, and I wouldn't want to use that. And this is also just the way it was in BF3 to some degree. So that's my preference. I mean, with all of these different things, you can do it based on preference. Um. One thing that helps a lot of people is vehicle boost. If you put it on the hold, you won't have that pesky issue with afterburners where you press it and you try to turn it off, but it doesn't turn off and you go way over speed. So if you have it on hold, you just have to tap it a bunch and it automatically turns itself off so you don't overspeed nearly as much. But if you have it on toggle, all you gotta do is press it on and off really quickly. So continuing, we go into advanced options. And here's one of the big settings that'll change just your camera view in general. The default way in Battlefield 4 is the jet chase camera roll on. And that means the camera follows and rolls with the jet. Some people like this. I don't really like it. It's a lot different than the BF3 cam. So a lot of old BF3 dogfighters really dislike it. And so they will switch it to off, in which case it goes back to the BF3 camera. I will show you what these look like right now. So here it is with it on. Notice the camera moves around and stays. It doesn't move around on the jet. It stays at the same fixed spot on the jet. And now I'll change it to the BF3 cam. Now your jet moves around the camera. So it stays fixed at the horizon to some degree, and then it flips over the top and then continues with that. So when you roll, the jet rolls over the jet, or rolls around the camera. So that's basically it for setup. I guess I didn't have to crash. What we're gonna go into next is basic speed control. So a lot of you probably heard the magical 315, 313, whatever it is. Really, there's a range between 310 to 315 where it's the best speed, and you're not really going to keep it on a certain number constantly. And even if you're sitting here monitoring it, it's pretty difficult to keep it right on one spot. But from what I've heard and from what I could tell, 313 is the absolute best. There's hardly any deviation to 310 and 315. But once you go to like 305, 318, 300, 320, that's when you start losing some of your turning ability. And when you go outside of that, you severely lose turning ability. So the basic idea to maintain the speed is to use your afterburners and your brakes to control it. So on the way up, because of gravity, of course, you use your afterburners. And on the way down, you brake. But it's not that simple. You got to have a certain pattern. This pattern has been not really debated, but different people have come up with different patterns for ages. I mean, the typical pattern I always saw was three taps on the way up and then hold the brake on the way down until the camera flips. So you start tapping once the back end of your jet clears the horizon. So right now, and then you start braking when the nose touches the horizon and you stop braking when the camera rolls back over. 
And that camera flip back over only happens on the BF3 cam. So with the BF4 cam, you just have to kind of view it when the when the jet's about probably about vertical on the way down, a little bit after it's vertical on the way down. And again with the speed, different patterns work for different people just based on how long they hold afterburners and how long they hold or mash the brakes or whatever they do. But the general idea is to afterburn the right amount on the way up and break the right amount on the way down. Yo, Leo, it's working for me now, dude. It's on my Rally. All right. Dude, in regards to that, uh, like, I can't stress enough how important it really is to take, you know, 10, 15 minutes out of your own day and focus on learning your speed patterns, how many times you have to tap going up in a specific angle. Because if you're just learning how to do a straight loop or a horizontal circle, that's great that you know how to do that. But most stock bikes are going to do scissors and they're going to change their angles up on you. You need to make sure that you know how many afterburns you need to put in at, you know, every little different angle. It's mm -hmm. very important. So at least figure out uh, three angles that are in between um, a loop and a horizontal. So just the other, you know, completely diagonal, in between the diagonal and the full loop on both ends as well. And once you know those, you should be good to go with your speed control. It could take a while, but, you know, really put in the time because muscle memory is an amazing thing and you won't be thinking about it anymore. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to get to where you can keep the speed with with only checking first person as little as possible. I mean, it's okay to check first person because, I mean, of course, you get to see your speed. The only problem with it is it, is it limits your field of view and it can you can miss a switch. You might mess up while you're checking your speed. I mean, it's best if you can stay in third person as long as you can. I mean, some people have gotten around this, like in BF3 days. There was a guy named Night Wayne who checked his speed literally every half second. Um, I know at my own stages, I used to check my speed a lot. Yeah, it I doesn't really that. kill you, but I mean, it. it's it's definitely optimal to be able to not have to check it so often. Um, Aaron, would you like to explain offset rudder 318 speed? I mean, besides just saying it, uh, it's just important to know that the optimum speed obviously is about 313 if you're doing correct rudders, which is to rudder in the same direction that your turn is going. So if you're turning to the left, you'll want to rudder to the left. That's correct rudder. Opposite rudder would be Generally, if you're doing a horizontal, whatever rudder is pointed up to the sky, but it would be the opposite direction of your turn. So if I'm turning to the left, I want my rudder to the right. So but you want to make sure that you're tilted slightly upside down. The whole point of this is to make sure that your rudder is, even if only a little bit, pulling you inside of your own turn radius. That way it's as tight as possible because you want to make sure that your turn is tighter than your opponent's turn so you can gain angles and slowly get a shot on them. So when you're going in opposite rudder, most people, you know, don't think about it too much, but you do want to stay around a two, uh, I mean, a 316, 17, 18 speed control uh, just because it gives you a little bit more of a G uh, when you're when you're doing your turn, so you'll gain a little bit more doing that as well. So it, it's crazy. Um, if you start a turn with someone and they do correct rudders, just practice it with a friend, and then uh, just you'll be able to see it for uh, see it for yourself. But uh, do a correct rudder turn at 313, and then have the other guy do an opposite rudder, trying to keep himself barely upside down. And have him do about 318, 317, 316, and you should be able to see the other guy doing the opposite rudder turn and get shots within that first half. So uh, just keep that in mind. It's something you need to be wary of, but opposite rudders don't – you have to use them – based on your opponent's altitude, and you want to make sure your turns are tight as possible at all times. So if you're going up and you're opposite ruddering, but they're at the same altitude as you are, all you're doing is sliding yourself above them. And that could actually put distance. You don't want to do that. So you're going to want to make sure uh, – there's a, there's a thing I like to say uh, to my friends. It's imagine – your, the enemy pilot has a lasso, and he's just swinging around, and he throws it around your rudders from his cockpit. 
and he's just yanking on your rudders from that. You know, whatever direction the rudders would be pointing, if he was yanking on those to pull you back into him, that's what you want to do at all times. Because unless someone's above you or below you in terms of overall altitude, not just because they're above you at the moment. I mean, if you were both leveled out, if one of you is higher than the other or lower than the other, that's when you're going to want to not follow that rule because you need to put yourself on their level. Uh, not in every instance, but it does help a lot. So and it, that's just the importance of uh, opposite rudders. You need to keep yourself on your opponent's altitude and... Just know the speed uh, that's optimum with them. Um, it's not super important to go 318. Sometimes it can screw people up because then they'll start rolling a little bit too fast in the regular stuff. Um, but it should happen on its own naturally. Uh, and just know that when you're doing opposite rudders correctly, you will kind of have to adjust your speed control again just because you'll be switching them back and forth. Uh, there's a lot of situations where you're ruddering correct on the way down but then you're ruddering opposite uh on the way up because you want to gain altitude or vice versa because you want to maintain your a tight loop that loses as little altitude as possible throughout that loop that way you can stay on the inside of your opponent's circle so for instance if i'm following someone who's at the same altitude as i am then on the way up i'll be correct ruddering and on the way down i can be opposite ruddering so i can stay above them because that way i'm my turn's just as tight as them, but I'm gaining altitude, so that way I'm going to get a shot. Because it slides me a little bit. It's, it's, I'm not the best at explaining it, but it's something you need to think about. So if you have anything else to add, just go ahead. All right, so the next thing we'll get into is just general dogfight mentality. And the main part of this is just the ability, and it comes with experience, so it's not something you'll get right away. The ability to, like, recognize and picture where the other dogfighter is at any given point. So basically, this comes from your passes. You see him, the radar. Um, just And basically, what you have to do with this is knowing where the enemy is. Don't try to, like, never switch away from him. Never, like try to create distance between them if you're like on defense like don't try to do major switches away or anything like that because Aaron do you like a switch away uh, well I gotta wait <laughs> okay <laughs> well you'll have to do it because you're on offense okay something like that and like switching away. See, I create a bunch of like space for him to see me. I mean, I kind of automatically went into scissors, but just stuff like that. You want to try to keep it as tight to the other person. And like he was saying with the lasso and ruddering towards him, you, that way you want to, I like to think of it kind of like MMA fighting. I don't know if you really were familiar with it, but I know that um, they try, like, in the fighting, they try really hard to keep the opponent really close because if they go out, then the other guy can punch them and they have that distance. Yep. So you kind of want to, like, keep it in a hug where the other guy is just there and he can't get shots on you. So you have to imagine wherever he is, he doesn't have enough room to shoot you. I don't know how good I'd be at explaining it, but for every move, plus I don't have the video to assist, but just always be conscien uh, conscious of where your rudder is sliding you. Uh, is it is it gaining you altitude? Is it sliding you outside of your opponent? I cannot tell you how many times I've watched a dogfight video from somebody and they start their dogfight by turning towards their opponent, but they rudder to the right and let's say they turn to the left, so that's opposite rudder, but all that does is gain you altitude while sliding you away from your opponent. After that first time, if you're fighting someone like Mookie on PC or ha actually I can do it too, then you're dead right there. Uh, and it's not because you'll necessarily die in that first turn. It's because I can get you weak enough with that one turn, and then if my prediction is good enough on your on your uh, counter move, you're dead. And it's just it it becomes that precise. So you always need to be wary of where that rudder is sliding you. It's so important. It, people stress speed control, and yeah, speed's great. It's important. You want to make sure it's down to a good level. But if you fight someone who has, you know, 308 to 315 speed control, it's, you know, off all over the place, but their rudder work is near flawless, you should lose that every time. Who 
And I think I've covered about everything we need to cover today for this basic lesson. Um, next lesson, I think we'll get into basic defensive and basic offensive ideas. So the basics of cutting, the basics of switches, and the basics of scissors. Yeah. Like probably just address yeah. the rolling scissors move. And I know it's like probably that. annoying, but um, seriously, everybody, practice just ruddering in an empty server and just visualize how that's affecting your jet. Just just look at where am I sliding when my rudder is pointed in this direction. It's so important to know. That way when you're mid dog fight, it becomes more of a muscle memory kind of thing like, oh, well, I'm coming down from this angle of a loop and he's at this altitude on this side of me. So I should be ruddering in this direction to pull myself closer to him. You know, and, and, and is he below me? Do I want a not opposite rudder because I need to get low first and get line of sight so that I can see him before he switches because of, you know, bad field of view? Which even on BF3 you want to do that sometimes because you just you don't see him enough. So it's very tactical in that sense. So just make sure you do that. It might be a pain in the butt. And one thing that I don't know if it's done here as much, but when I was playing on BF3... Uh, with my friends, we always would just run situations with each other. You don't just fly into a server that has 12 jets and, oh, let's go do some random dogfights. You know, seriously, find a buddy and run some situations, find some moves, ask him, hey, how does this look when I rudder like this? And, you know, do, do, do am I losing you? Is it harder? Is it easier? You know, really be constructive and find someone to talk to. Don't just fly into a server and be like, oh, man, I'm just not getting any better, you know, because that's, that's not how you do it in school, you know. Yep, I just saw someone in the chat, I'm sure he's just trolling, and he said, just dogfight and get good, which I mean, to some yeah. degree, <laughs> practice, practice, practice is huge. Oh, absolutely, and yeah. I will Especially stress with that, it helps a lot to practice with someone that's just a little bit, like, don't go practicing with people that are way better than you. I mean, I guess it's fun to say you practice with someone that's really good or whatever, but I mean, it's not going to teach you much, and you're just going to get it frustrated, probably lose uh, encouragement, all that stuff. Try to find someone that's like around your level, but a little bit better. I mean, that's the optimum way, because that way it's it's kind of like bench pressing. I mean, you're raising your bar every like you're raising your weight every time you lift or whatever to raise your capacity overall. And I mean, that's the general thing. But you also have to learn. You can't just dogfight and try to teach yourself. I mean, you can. I mean, but good luck if you're going to try to teach yourself and not like ask people stuff like Aaron was saying or oh shit no and always remember the weapon maneuver which is you know where you crash into a mountain yeah <coughs> my uh <coughs> my dad jumped on my table I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> my pants were too tight right <laughs> alright well I think that's that for that lesson uh, we will guess. see you in a week with more lessons. Or just bad advice. <laughs> Adios.